Hello everybody and welcome to today's stream, live sessions with the gym, that would be me, Guy. Uh, thank you for joining me, thank you for being here, it's wonderful to see you all. So many people in chat already busy talking, shouting, screaming over the choice of music. Uh, that uh, electric guitar keeps sneaking in there, don't know how it does that, anyway, it's there now. So the stream is um, in full swing. We have got such a busy show today, I have been working all morning trying to fix it. It's 11, it's 10 o'clock here, 10 a.m. in Tokyo today, and um, if any of you have a very old sense of humor and a very, um, very old um, TV show, one of the first that came out of a certain British country, uh, it is Are Not Raining here in Japan. If you get that reference, I'm going to give you a thousand experience points because it means you are a cultured viewer of ancient television. It is Are Not Raining here in Japan. And uh, yeah, see what you can come up with on that one. So uh, I'm just muting my phone because I realize that it's still on and that's just crazy. Right, let's look at what's going on. Wow, you're in Japan. Yes, yes I am. I'm in Japan just outside of Tokyo for that matter. Uh, so there we go. And uh, yes, uh, thank you for liking the background. I've been working on them trying to make them a bit more interesting, a bit more dynamic. So we're playing around with a whole bunch of different options and ideas. And there we go. Now I'm not trying to be all hipster with my collar up. This is the the style that's currently uh, it's a new shirt that I just bought from a uh, very particular type of retailer here in Japan the only retailer that sells clothing that fits me um, nonetheless this is the this is the style this is the style for the, for, for, for this for this uh, season so there we go anyway right so many things happening where do we start I know where we start we're gonna start with talking about the competition now the competition the competition was for some dice. Let me show you. Let me show you these dice that we were talking about. Now, if you have not seen this, if you have not seen these dice, <clears throat> uh, if you have not, uh, hang on a moment. Let's just let's that's a bit silly. Uh, let's do it this way. If you have not seen these dice, these are dice from Q Workshop. Now they glow. They glow beautifully. Now, if you haven't watched my video on uh, bad luck, uh, players with bad luck and how to deal with them, that came out this week on the YouTube channel. Have a look, see, go and watch it. And um, yeah, it's too late to enter the competition now. I'm afraid because, well, <laughs> I had to count nearly, nearly 280 entries. It's the biggest we've ever had, which is fantastic. I certainly appreciate that. But then again, the dice are absolutely amazing. So. Yeah, well worth it. Now, I'm going to throw into chat the link to their Kickstarter. Now, the Kickstarter... Oh, dear God. No, that's a disaster. That's not linked to their Kickstarter. Um, the Kickstarter has already started. And basically, it's done. They reached their goal. But they've got some nice stretch goals that are coming up. So the link there is in chat. Um... Have a look at that. Uh, go and join the Kickstarter if you want. Their shipping options apparently are very, very good. Uh, we will be giving away, we will be rolling and announcing the winners, by the way, of the three dice sets that they gave me to give away. Um, beautiful, beautiful dice. I think they're very pretty anyway. Uh, three different three different colors. So we're going to be giving those away throughout the show. But, well, not just yet. Not just yet. We want to give everybody time to realize the show is happening and then come back again. But there's so much more that's going on. There's so much more. It's been so busy here. So chaotic at How to Be a Great Gym. We're I, I'm having an absolute blast. Um... Every day it's like, okay, got to do this, got to do this, got to do da, 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 da. Anyway, so, so there we are. If you're wondering what on earth this thing is, this is the monster. If you uh, donate in Super Chat or if you uh, give us bits and things or if you subscribe on the Twitch channel, this will move as you defeat the monster known as Dead Aussie Gamer. He uh, was the lead last week and then you will be replaced. Uh, well, you will replace them, I should say, if you knock him off his post as the monster to beat this week. Right. Now, normally we have, well, let's go, let's see, what, what should we be doing? What should we be talking about in today's show? This is what we should be talking about. We should be talking about YouTube videos to watch. Yes, I've got six amazing YouTube videos to watch. They are absolutely awesome. I think this week is really a week worth looking at YouTube. So there's definitely that. Creative writing. Oh, yes. We've got some creative writing exercises to do today. Uh, Q Workshop giveaway. Yes, I've spoken about that. We're going to come and give some of those away a little bit later on. 
Fantasy Grounds. We're going to be talking about Fantasy Grounds. Why, you might ask. I will tell you more later on. And then we're going to talk about Gen Con. We've got Gen Con to talk about. What else are we going to talk about? Uh, Tokyo. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Tokyo. We're going to be talking about something else that's happening in Tokyo. Uh, or at least that, that I'm, I'm, I'm involved in, in Tokyo. For those of you that don't necessarily want to play Dungeons & Dragons, but want to play another system that's like Dungeons & Dragons, but it's not. But it kind of is. Anyway, nonetheless, there's, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff. Now, for the competition, I had to split my screens up differently to how I normally do it. Do it. So, the chat is way over. I mean, we, we're talking like a foot and a half at least away from me. So, it's going to be difficult to see. Now, what I want you to do is, if you have a question, because there are questions. This is supposed to be for you to be able to answer question, uh, ask questions and I get to answer them and somebody else gets to answer them who's better than I am. Nonetheless, if you have a question, please, in the front, type in big caps lock, question. Ask, uh, put a big, big, big shout at me, question, otherwise I will not see it. If I don't answer it, post it again. Just keep spamming it. Eventually I'll see it or someone will say, listen, it's not a good thing. Um... So there we go. I see already someone saying, uh, not a question, but the shirt looks good, Guy. Thank you. Um, it's actually a terrible shirt for broadcast. If I was running a show, I would have had a freak out if my guests had arrived um, because it kind of does this weird pattern thing. Not so much these days, but in the old days of television, it would have been absolutely terrible. So there we are. Right. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, so there was a question. Oh, dear. Someone asked if I had actually watched the Curse of the Vampire Coast trailer yet. I haven't. I forgot. I didn't write it down. I'm going to write it down again because or um, uh, Curse of the Vampire Coast. I wonder if we should make a channel watch. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Okay, so I have written it down there. Watch. Oh, some spoilers coming up there. No, no, oh, oh, no, 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 no. There we go. Okay, so let's do some questions quickly before we move anywhere else. Because I think there's some questions that are coming through. Honorable596 asked me the question, did I watch Curse, Curse of the Vampire Coast? No, I forgot to watch it. I will add it to my list of things to watch. Uh, right, DG says, do you ever worry about other people stealing your ideas? Um, no. No, I'm not. I have lots of ideas. I have ideas all the time. And if they help people tell a better story or run a better game, that's absolutely fantastic. Of course, if they take one of the videos that we've made and they repost them as their own video on another YouTube channel and monetize it, well, that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing altogether. Yay, bits. Thank you very much for those bits. Uh, Laura Bones, thank you for that. Um, I always chuckle when I see Laura's name because it does pop up everywhere. It's absolutely awesome. It's like Twitter competition. Yep, yeah, there's, there's Laura's name. Absolutely love it. I hope you like the dinosaur adventure, Laura. Um, nonetheless. So there we go. Yeah, so I don't I don't have an issue with people stealing my ideas. If people take my ideas and call them as their own and they don't credit me, well, that's on them as far as I'm concerned. The world is a very, very big place and there's not a huge amount that one can do really about protecting your your intellectual property your ideas as you as you call them so i mean today for example i'm going to be talking about two different things one of them is um, a book that I was commissioned to write. I can't show you what's in that book yet because it belongs to the publisher. But, um, you know, it's something that, that I created, which means somebody else could quite easily create. And then the second one is what I'm going to be doing on Fantasy Grounds. Uh, so there is uh, that also. Yeah, take it, use it. If it makes your game better, brilliant. And so there we go. Uh, even if I don't have a lot of bits, I can give a bunch. There we go. Well, Ryan Nine, thank you for that. You're also one of our regulars on the show. And I also, um, well, I enjoy seeing everybody here who I know already. And I enjoy seeing, of course, the new people who have just joined us. Okay, so next question. I will take questions until 20 minutes past the hour. And so that is another six minutes. Yeah. So question. Robo Wamil. 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 Uh, says, how do I roleplay a good cleric paladin who doesn't hate my warlock fellow party member? It's a good question, especially if your warlock fellow party member is playing someone who is evil or uh, does things of dubious intent. There isn't necessarily a reason why a good paladin would necessarily not work with a warlock if the warlock's patron is even a, a, a demon of some kind. If the warlock, of course, tells the paladin this, I would suggest that what the paladin does 
or the characters anyway, and from a character perspective, is look at the paladin and say, or, or look at the warlock anyway, and try and unpack why the warlock made their pact in the first place. Was it because they were desperate, perhaps? Maybe they were lured into it. Perhaps they're not on uh, their own cognizance. Maybe they were uh, forced into doing it. Firstly, I would try and unpack that. Then I would try and unpack how the paladin can help the warlock to overcome or to adjust or to change their way. That is something that I would also look at just to see if, if, if there are some solutions, if there's some options, if there's some ways in which the paladin could work. But all of this could take place over the year of role playing. So for a year, the paladin begrudgingly works with this warlock. And when the warlock tries to do something that is overtly evil or necessarily against the paladin's um, uh, ethos and, and rulings and edicts and things, then the paladin can mention that either they won't be part of that, not part of the adventure, by the way, they won't be part of the particular action. So if the action is to assassinate the princess, the paladin might come along to keep his companions safe and all the whilst still helping the party, talking to the warlock. Maybe we don't have to assassinate the princess. Perhaps it's merely a case of telling her to change her mind. Maybe we could take her as a hostage and convince her father to change his policy. So look for alternatives, but still go along with the journey of the party. Still go along with the party. Otherwise, re-roll your character. If you're not prepared to try and find solutions, and you would rather just say, well, my character is this and this and this, c'est la vie, auf Wiedersehen, sayonara. There we go. Three different languages, and I probably butchered them all. Okay, so that was, that's, 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 that's that question. Love the man, hate the deed, says Lance Pickett, and I agree with Lance, uh, whom I also saw in the competition, by the way. So there we go. Looking forward to that. Let's see what happens. Um, talk Knop blog. Uh, question. You need to follow that up with a question, if you please. Uh, Stranger says, Dragon Rider one shot for my group tomorrow. Just two players. Thoughts, ideas. Oh, you are going to have so much fun, Stranger. Two players is A. A very fast game, be a very intimate game. Now, I'm not talking intimate as in candles and, you know, romantic music and little fires crackling in the corner and someone stuffing someone else with marshmallows and sweet corn. Uh, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the intimacy of the characters. The story is now so focused around those two characters, you are now basically running a feature film where you have the hero and their sidekick. Unlike a party, which is much more of a collaborative type of thing or an ensemble type of feature film where everyone gets to shine a little bit, here you've got two very specific heroes. Make sure to treat them like that. Make sure to make it the cent them the center of the story, but also remember that you're gonna be moving quite quickly. So I would plan out a little bit more than you normally do. I would also try and give them one NPC. This is not from a balanced perspective. I'm sure you can do that on your own. This is more from a fact that they can now engage. So perhaps if they're dragon riders, they're dragons. Both dragons are NPCs. You need to give them a dragon each, otherwise it becomes a bit weird. But if they both have dragons and the dragons are both sentient, the dragons become NPCs, and then you can play a lot more with that entire situation. So absolutely. I would also perhaps, if you are running short of ideas in terms of storyline and, and, and things like that, is look to films that involve vehicular motion. So if you look at, for example, and this is just off of the top of my head and it shows you just how old I am. If you look at the film Speed, for example, with Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock way back when, what a wonderful pairing. Nonetheless, if you look at that film, the bus can't go slower than 50 miles an hour or whatever the speed might be. You know, they're going to drive around the city and survive whilst trying to find the bomb and all that kind of stuff. Imagine if it's a case of the dragon can't land because if it does, the glyphs that have been imprinted upon its feet are going to ignite and blow the dragon up to pieces. So they have to keep the dragon flying, but the dragon's going to get tired, so they're going to have to try and carry it on the other dragon or bring it food whilst it's flying. I mean, you can really go mad in terms of choosing a film and just pulling the plot and converting it over to your realm uh, and having a lot of fun with it. And if you look at, if you look at something like Speed or, or I, I, could, I could 
think of more modern versions um, to be sure. But uh, if you look at it, the cast was not big. It was Keanu, it was Sandra, it was a bus. There was old um, Dennis Hopper's character who was goading them along. And that was about it. It wasn't a very big cast. So there we go. Definitely something to, to add perhaps to your repertoire. Time, time is up, but I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to say, please, no more questions for now. Hold your questions. Keep those questions close to your heart. Keep them with you all the time, but don't ask them anymore. We will come back to questions a little later. We will come back to questions a little bit later. So there we go. I'm going to take one more question and that's from Traxar Omega. Um, let me go up to that one. Uh, Trackstar Omega. Trackstar Omega. Uh, I'm making a new character for a sci-fi campaign, yay, uh, that comes from a medieval homeworld. How would you recommend I play this character? How can I make them fit into the story in a fun and interesting way? So it's a fish out of water story. Fish out of water story. Now, the fish out of water story, of course, is the journey of someone who has absolutely no clue. It's the country bumpkin who moves into the big city. Uh, West Side Story. Is it West Side Story? No, it's not West Side Story. Anyway, um, the idea of the country bumpkin, uh, of the character who's out of their depth. There are two ways of playing it. One way, which is generally how Hollywood kind of plays it, is for the first hour or so, everything is new and fresh and, and totally different. And by the second hour of play, the characters completely au fait with all of the systems. And it's only occasionally that they screw up with um, not knowing what necessarily to do. If you watch The Little Mermaid, for example, that is a classic example of a fish out of water. Ha! Ha, I slay me. Yes, uh, it's a fish. <laughs> yeah, mm, uh, anyway. So, and I don't even have children to make those jokes. So I'm not even a dad joke. That's a pity. Anyway, Little Mermaid, fish out of water type of scenario. So I would not push it too far. There's a reason why they don't push it too far. It gets annoying after a while. I'm like that in Japan. I kind of wander around. I don't speak Japanese. And it's like, ah, oh, oh, fish out of water. Don't know what to do. Don't know where to go. It's very tedious. And I'm the one who's doing it to myself as well. So anyway, yes, I would definitely look at having a few quirks, a few things where it's like, well, on my world, we do it this way. Look at Thor. There's a contemporary. Wow, I can actually use a contemporary example. That film only came out 15 years ago. So or 10 years ago. Nonetheless, look at Thor. Thor, when he was in his first film, was very thou soup, so, 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 so. Jean Collet, my appreciation. Jean Collinette. Jean Collinet, I, however you want to pronounce it. Thank you for that donation. I do appreciate it. So if you look at Thor, he was a fish out of water. He had these and thous, etc., etc., etc. All these kinds of crazy things that uh, took place. And he adjusted very quickly. And by the time we get to Endgame, of course, well, he's adjusted to being a typical human exceptionally quickly and that's all i'm going to say on that okay so out of place but wait what 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 do i like sushi says uh, michael morris i said no more questions but this is not related to role playing so i'm going to take it i don't like sushi i don't like fish i don't like shellfish i don't like sushi i'm not a particularly huge fan of noodles either uh, give me straight up noodles, but there's all kinds of noodles here in Japan. Most of them involve being boiled in water for a very long time. Uh, so, yes, you would have thought I would have slimmed down whilst in Japan, having such a limited palate from which one can eat. But um, no, 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 that left me with rice and chicken, uh, which does sound healthy, but not, not, not when you eat it in Japan. You'd be amazed at how the Japanese uh, prepare some of their dishes beautifully, by the way, and very, very tasty. So there you go. Now, um, what was I going to talk about? Oh, 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 YouTube videos. YouTube videos that you have to watch. This is it. So hold your questions until I have done the YouTube videos. Now, as per usual, as per usual, I will be giving you some YouTube videos to go and have a look at, to go and get inspired by, to watch, to laugh and giggle over and to move on from. First person to post the link in either Twitch or in YouTube, so it's both at the same, I mean, it's running, 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 running on both. First person to post up the link to the video that I'm referring to, you are going to earn, because we're giving away dice, 
because we're giving away dice, I'm actually going to use a dice. He said not having any dice next to him. That's a lie. He has dice right next to him. Who am I joking? I'm going to use a dice, and you are going to earn yourself 100 experience points. Oh, look at how this dice keys out. Oh, that's so mysterious. Ooh, how mysterious. It's completely green dice. So if I held it up there... <laughs> Talk about seeing through your dice. Well, there that one goes. Anyway, all right, so 100 experience points if you get the link up first for the YouTube video that I am talking about. I'm going to start with an easy one to kind of get you into the flow of things. Now, I'm ready and waiting on YouTube because YouTube does not allow uh, people to post links up unless someone approves it. So that's, that's, that falls to me. Uh, first one. Here is the title. Here is the title of the YouTube episode. Role-playing terrorist, or role-play terrorist, role-play terrorist. Role-play terrorist by Seth Skorkowski. That's the YouTube channel. Seth Skorkowski, role-play terrorist. Now, what I loved about this video is Seth touches on a very difficult subject. It is a difficult subject because, as he says in the video, there is a difference between... Uh, Josh, S, Josh S got it. Kyle, oh, all the links coming through. All the links coming through on YouTube. I don't know about Twitter. I don't know how we're doing on Twitter. I'm in the, I'm in the wrong one here. Uh, Twitter, you guys are just going to have to watch yourselves. There. Oh, look at that. Serpents Embrace 2, I think. I think got it. Um, let's see. All right, so the links have come through. There we go. 100 experience points for each of you. When you have accumulated 1,000 experience points, you officially level up, and you can call yourself one level higher. Now, Seth Gorkowski talks about the role-play terrorists. These are terrorists. These are individuals who really come to screw up your game, and they're not doing it intentionally to destroy your game. They're just doing it because they themselves are not necessarily great people. Watch his video. He has such a dry sense of humor. I absolutely, absolutely enjoy his videos. I really, really, really do. So have a look. Have a look. So that's Seth Skorkowski, uh, roleplay terrorist. Definitely worth watching. On a slightly lighter note, slightly lighter note, um, this one is called Betrayal Running the Game. Betrayal Running the Game. That's the title of today's YouTube video. Betrayal Running the Game. Matthew Colville. Matthew Colville released a video. Betrayal Running the Game. Now, for those of you that don't know the rules, generally speaking, I'm talking about videos that came out this week. Good Lord, stranger. That wasn't even done unless that's the old one. Anyway, Matthew Colville, Betrayal Running the Game. Definitely, definitely one to look out for. Uh, I love... <laughs> I, I hope, I hope to meet Mr. Colville at Gen Con this year. I hope he's going to be there. I do hope he's going to be there. Because he starts his show by criticizing those of us who start our shows with a skit. And then he promptly does one. I absolutely, absolutely adore it. I like that sense of humor. I think it's very, very funny. And uh, I hope, well, I mean, he doesn't need any likes or anything like that. His channel is so big. He is the king of, of uh, the domain, I suppose. But uh, yes, nonetheless, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Why is everyone putting up vids? Asks uh, Kathia Star. Kathia Star. We are just providing the links to you so that you can go and watch these videos at your leisure later on, uh, giving them some love, giving you some education in terms of some of these topics, which I think are pretty well handled in this week's videos. If you get the video link up first before anybody else, you get 100 experience points. So there we go, 100 experience points. Um, so it's something to, to, to be aware of. I see Michael Morris is saying they don't really like sushi either. Seafood is awesome. Yeah, I see. I never, never grew up eating seafood. My father's highly allergic to it. So I never developed the taste for, for fish and, 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 and the like. Anyway, give me a nice lamb, a nice roast lamb, roast beef, roast pork, roast chicken, roast, anything roasted pretty Roast fish. You can't really roast fish. Well, you can, I suppose. Anyway, that, that's not digress. Okay, the next video. The next video. This is one that has featured before. He was actually on the channel the other day. 
running heavy role-playing sessions. Running heavy role-playing sessions. I am envious of this man because he wears sunglasses. I... I do not. I can't. Because I have to wear real glasses. Unless I'm wearing my contacts, which I'm not wearing today for some unknown reason, because I forgot, basically. Nonetheless, taking 20. Taking 20. Running heavy role-playing games. There we go. All of the YouTube flooding through with the links. Well done. Um, I see some other people agreeing with me about no fish. No, don't go there. Oh, God. Oh, what have I done? I clicked on the link. Uh, Taking me away from the live stream. That's kind of... Oh, please don't break anything. Please don't break it. Please don't break it. He said in desperation. Oh, it was bound to happen. It was bound to happen. We were having almost a flawless stream. Anyway. Okay, yeah. So, so um... Cody takes us through heavy role-playing sessions. What I like about his approach here is that he talks about more practical, sociable kind of stuff than anything else, in my opinion. So I, I really appreciate that from him in terms of that, that particular video. Three videos left. Three videos left. I'm saving the two difficult ones for last. So let's go to this one. If you are a crafter, if you like making things, now I do, I, I used to make all kinds of little props and things, I'm busy working on some crafting stuff at the moment, um, so I, I'm a crafter and I like watching craft videos as well, because they kind of teach you stuff and they show you what, what trips, tricks, uh, tips and tricks, all that kind of stuff. So, custom treasure tokens, custom treasure tokens for frost greaves. Uh, grave, frost grave, custom treasure tokens for frost grave, black magic craft. Now, black magic craft, top of his game in terms of his crafting stuff, absolutely top of his game in terms of crafting. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Emma, I see, is on the ball in terms of going there. Uh, black magic craft. Those of you who are going to meet the web goblin at um, Gen Con this year. They look very similar, in my opinion. Uh, Black Magic Craft has a nicer beard than the Web Goblin does, but that's because the Web Goblin is... Uh, he's one of those, should he have a beard, shouldn't he have a beard? Anyway, um, I'm pulling his leg, of course. Okay, so the last two. Now, which one do I do? Okay, so the last one, this one, I have to say, I'm a bit of a history, a history nerd. Surprise. <laughs> and this last one, this is a YouTube channel that I wish I was on. I really do. I really wish I could I could be part of this one because this guy has so much fun. He really, really, really does. Where does medieval ink come from? That's the question and the title of the video that he posted up this week. Where does medieval ink come from? Now, my immediate dismissal was um, octopus ink. That's what I would have thought. That's that's what I would have thought. Um, I was wrong. Uh, then I thought, um, wow, okay. Someone knows where to go. The link's up before I finish introducing the damn video. Uh, that, I, that's 200 experience points to both of you. Both of you that put up that link, 200 experience points, because that was just amazing um, to get there before I did. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so Oak Galls. Oak galls? Who knew? Well, apart from everyone who's going to watch this video. It's a fascinating video. Um, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So, Medieval History TV. For those of you that don't know, Medieval TV History. Where does Medieval ink come from? It comes from infected oak trees. Now, if that is not a trigger to immediately get you to go, Ha! Now that is an adventure waiting to happen. Hang on a moment. All of the ink in the kingdom has ceased production because there are no longer any infected oak trees because there's some crazy wizard running around preventing it from... a uh, druid running around preventing it from happening. That's insane. I do like that idea. Or an infected oak tree attacks the party because it's an infected oak tree and that's what they do. I think it's absolutely, absolutely awesome. Anyway, well worth watching that one. I was glued from start to finish. But it's not... Fast pace, but again, neither am I, so there you go. Right, the last one. Now, this one is complete folly. It is completely for fun. It is simply because I am a gigantic Star Wars fanatic, and I like to share the love 
Whoever did this, well, you'll find out who did it. Uh, these guys really put a huge amount of effort into this production. I would have one technical gripe, but that's it. The rest, I think, is very, very, very well done, and, and, and I applaud people who do this. Fix It In Post is the name of the channel, but it's spelt F-X-I-T-I-N, post. So F-X. It in post. Fix it in post is a classic, classic television refrain. When anyone says, wait, is that the link already? That's impossible. It can't be the link, surely. Uh, well, let's see. Fix it in post. FX it in post. If you have ever worked in te 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 television, you will know this for absolute sure. Uh, Clocktopus got there first. Sam DD, I just released yours first. Clocktopus did get there first. Uh, First, just in this case, I'm afraid. Fix it in post. Well, maybe, maybe have you got the right video? Let's see, because they've done a lot of videos. Nonetheless, fix it in post. Star Wars scene 38, reimagined. Now, scene 38 is the famous scene between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original 1977 Star Wars. A New Hope, and it was an epic scene. It was a scene that nobody expected because it was, to a very large degree, a movie standard setting where this character, this important character, dies quite dramatically and quite voluntarily as well. It blew the minds of everybody watching that film. They were all like, what the hell was going on? Oh, you can't do this. And they did. So it was it was really good. These guys, FX, it in post, fix it in post, have done the most remarkable job in terms of reimagining the battle sequence as if it wasn't performed by a very old Alec Guinness and a heavily encumbered David Prowse, who were the two original actors in the film. Um, and also lightsaber technology at that stage, they were still handing it, uh, hand painting on each frame, painting over the original uh, poles that the actors used for their lightsabers. Um, it was a very simple scene and they've pushed it even further. So that is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, definitely, definitely something to have a look at if you are a Star Wars fan and want something amusing to watch. That's enough from me. Let's go to the first giveaway, I think. That is the YouTube videos to watch. I have got to watch Curse of the Vampire Coast. It is something that I must do. I can now go back to the chat because I don't need to keep that open. So lots of things coming through. Um, yeah, uh, lots of links and things coming through as well. Just a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And um, yeah, some of the guys, I don't know how they do it so quickly. I don't know how they do it so quickly. Uh, I do know that that Star Wars video is an old one, but it was shared to me by a very good friend of mine. Uh, I consider him my brother in all contexts. And as far as I'm concerned, that is a very good example of a paladin and um, well, perhaps a warlock having a friendship that lasts and survives the difference of morals. He is a very devout Christian and a pastor and goes and does missionary work into Africa. And fundamentally, he and I are very, very, very opposite in terms of our views. And yet we are inseparable friends and will follow each other to the ends of the earth. As a matter of fact, we have a running bet as to who will get to the age of 121 first. The loser has to buy the winner a house in Sweden or Norway on the fjords. Now, I'm not entirely sure how that bet came about, but whoever gets to 121 first proves that they're right and the other is wrong. Uh, so a lot of... A lot of fun there. Anyway, he is a very good friend of mine. He said, hey, have you seen the Star Wars video? We're both Star Wars fans. And so I ran along and had it and thought I would share. Now, to the first giveaway. And what I'm going to do, because I know people like specific colours. Now, we've got orange. We've got blue. Blue. And we have pink. Or rose, I suppose. Well, pink and pinkish rose. They kind of remind me. I would probably eat these. They look like Turkish delights uh, made out of rose water and whatnot. So we've got three of these to give away. I'm going to give away the first one because I don't think we're going to get more people in the stream. We're sitting at 130 people, which is fantastic anyway. I'm going to give away one of these. Now, you had to have entered the competition from the video before. So if you don't know why am I giving these away, uh, definitely, definitely, definitely... Um, 
go watch that video. It's too late now. We're going to roll for it. So I, I looked at the entries and there were some people who got two entries. There were some people who only got one entry. It depended on what your perception check was. If you passed your perception check, you got two, two. If you failed, mm, you only got one entry. But all odds are even. So I'm going to announce one of the winners, one of the three winners, and uh, we're going to go from there. So let's see if I've set this up correctly. I wanted to do a random draw because there were so many entries and uh, it was it was important. It was important. Now, uh, let's see. So I have set this up. I have got our chat, our Discord server open here. Please, if you're watching, share a link with everyone watching. If you are part of our Discord, share a link with people so they can go and join in. And we've got this dice rolling channel where we've got this dice bot and you can roll dice. As you can see, I've been practicing. Uh, you go forward slash R1D, let's say 658,000. And that gives us number 546,660. No, we didn't have that many entries, but there we go. On the that so that's on that side. That's the random number generator. And on this side above me is all of the entries that we got in. So there are in total three hundred and eighty-one people who who are eligible to win. Three hundred and eighty-one. So I will be rolling a one uh, to three hundred and eighty-one die so that uh, we will determine the first winner. Now, I'm going to eventually have all three winners, and I'm going to ask each of the winners to then send me their preferred color. That's how kind I am. If I don't get a response, by the way, by next week, Friday, I will draw somebody else. So, let it be known. Let it be known. If I don't get a response, if I don't get a, oh, I'd like orange, I'd like blue, I'd like pink, or I don't care, that's that's on you. You've had a week. This is social media. This is important. This is something for us to look at. Um, Stogie, I see, has come into the Dice Writing channel, which is fantastic. It's a public channel, and we've got 3,500 people there. It makes sense. So, drum roll, if you please. I don't have a drum roll loaded up. I should have had a drum roll loaded up. Anyway, our first, first winner is forward slash roll, and this is courtesy of Q Workshop, our new affiliate sponsor for the YouTube channel and the ones who are running that amazing Kickstarter. Forward slash roll. 1D, 380. Did I say 381? Goldfish memory. Memory of a goldfish. Just make sure. 381. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Just deleted uh, Harrowed Mine. 381. And the winner is... 365 Centurion uh, 19. Centurion 19. Look at you using Roman neural, new, numerals. Roman numerals. So that's winner one. Please tell me that I didn't type that in there. No, I didn't. Okay, great. Winner number one. That is uh, Bascom underscore Ethan. That is Centurion 19. For those of you who don't know your... Oh, let me get out of the way. Centurion... 19 uh, or Centurion XIX. Uh, well done. You are our first winner. I'm going to do another winner on the hour, so stay with us when we return on that one. All uh, right. So let's go back here. Centurion, well done. Congratulations. I don't know if you're watching the show, um, but uh, there you go. Uh, you have uh, one. You have one week. One week only. One week to tell me whether you want orange, orania, blue, ow, in Japanese is blue, ow, a-u, uh, ow, or pink, uh, which is pink in English, um, simply because I don't, rouge, no, rouge is red in French, I don't know. Anyway, don't forget to like the stream, everyone says stranger, yes, absolutely, jealous says white tiger, kapla, says, uh, H-L-R-F. I see that as health, but I know it's not. Anyway, Kapla, Klingon for success. Lovely. Okay, more questions. It is question time. We will take questions until the end of this hour. So you have 16 minutes to ask your questions. Get those questions coming in, please. Let's, uh, let's get some answers going. So there we go. Let's get some questions in. I would suggest looking up Vampire Coast between battle between videos on YouTube. 
I can suggest a good channel if you wish. Sure, I'm going to look at this uh, Vampire Coast battle. It really needs to be absolutely spectacular now because it has really been a... Um, ah, aha! There is the question I was waiting for, White Tiger 225. The plant spreadsheet. I have bad news for you, I'm afraid. I went and I looked through my emails. I looked through the documentation. I looked from everywhere that I possibly could to try and find the name of the individual who sent it to me. And I could not do that. So I cannot release the document in good conscience because the person may not want to release it publicly. I have it in the back of my mind that they said I could share it, but I can't be certain. And unfortunately, I cannot therefore share it. So if you happen to be an individual who sent through a list of plants and their medicinal values to me, please just drop me another line somewhere, anywhere, and say, I sent you the list. Release it. And then I will release it. So yes, unfortunately, after all of that, I could not find it. I looked and looked and looked and looked, but I could not, could not find it. So there we are. Next question. Um, Cloctopus. Cloctopus says, how can I craft moral dilemmas for my players? Well, there's a question and a half. I'm going to take a sip of this. If you're new to the stream, that's um, half Coca-Cola and half water. I find it very refreshing. I had a friend of mine, a very dear friend, very good role player and a good GM. Um, he used to call it blushing. We're going to blush the drink. And that's when you mix half and half. Um, it just takes the edge off, I find. Anyway, moral dilemmas. Firstly, you need to make sure that your players are comfortable with moral dilemmas. This can be an issue for some players. There are many players who go, I, I don't want to choose. I don't want to have to be forced to make the decision between saving the child and eating the child. Uh, those are things that you want to avoid if your players don't like them. So before you run any moral dilemmas, have a very open conversation with your players where you ask them, should I, could I include a moral dilemma? At which point they might say, well, what's a moral dilemma? Kill 100 people to save 10,000 people. In a role-playing game, that's not so much of a moral dilemma. It really isn't. Uh, you have to impregnate the queen before the full moon, otherwise she's going to turn into a demon, but she doesn't want you to, so you're forcing yourself upon her. That's a moral dilemma, and it touches on a whole lot of other grounds as well. It starts to make it very difficult for people to choose and to operate from. So definitely ask them if they are happy to run moral dilemmas in the first place. Then you need to set up your moral dilemma. And your moral dilemma needs to be very obvious in a way, but it also needs to be part of the entire story. So you can't just slap in a moral dilemma randomly here or there. Now, oftentimes moral dilemmas arise when the players, well, when the characters anyway, are supposed to choose between something that's ethically wrong and something that's ethically worse or maybe the same. That's what a true moral dilemma is. It's not that it's choosing between good and bad. That's easy. It's between bad and bad. That's where it becomes tricky. So make sure that your two options are that obvious. And it sounds kind of like, duh, obviously they should be. But there are times when GMs create a moral dilemma where it actually isn't a moral dilemma. Or where it's such a simple dilemma. Let me move this a little bit closer. It's such a simple dilemma that um, it is a non-event. So then it builds up and it feels like nothing actually happened. Mm, that's not so great. Okay, so that's the long and short of it. I Moral dilemmas. I will add it to the list of videos. I think I have a video anyway, moral dilemmas. So that puts me in a dilemma. I think I have a video on moral dilemmas, but I don't know where it would be. And there's 400 other suckers now. So that's a lot of videos to trawl through to find, find it. Maybe I'll do a video on moral dilemmas because they can be fun. They can be a lot of fun to watch your players squirm and um, a very, uh, yeah. So anyway, a very interesting topic. I think I will see if it is on the list. Okay, next question. Mm -hmm. Kitsune Work says, how to role play low charisma characters? 
Charisma has always been an issue in role-playing and is always an issue when it comes to trying to figure out how to do this. Now, we can take away the word charisma and simply replace it with beauty, with authority, with charm, with uh, grace. There are so many components that fit within the catch-all of charisma that it is difficult to identify how to role play bad charisma. Now, what is also important is that you don't necessarily just have charisma in Dungeons and Dragons. There are many systems out there which try to track just how well you come across. You might have someone who is particularly ugly, but they are incredibly charismatic. So we want to listen to them. Adolf Hitler, for example, wasn't a particularly tall man. He wasn't a beautiful man by his own standards, which is particularly ironic. Winston Churchill, again, maybe it was just the era of trusting square-headed people. Um, maybe not. Again, you then look at actors that we are absolutely enamored with. Sure, they're the sex symbols that we all look and fawn over, but there are also actors that we look at and we go, that's... That that's just, I want to be near that person. Now, a good example of a low charisma, but not necessarily being physically unattractive or having, mm, I would say, bad grace, but having very little tact, which is definitely a charismatic trait, would be House from House MD. Very bad charisma. He was gruff. He was rude. He kind of just laid out the law but he at the same time had a certain authority to him so his charisma score I would say was probably somewhere around eight I wouldn't put it much lower than that because there was that intelligence behind it that allowed him to come up with solutions and things on the other hand let's say someone who is truly physically disgusting and repulsive with multiple mouths all over the place or however that might be that charisma score might go a little bit a little bit lower but again to have a charisma score of one needs to means to me that is someone who is physically repulsive who is intellectually repulsive who is someone who is desperate not to have anybody near them they're not trying in the slightest and I think that people who are in society do try to a degree whether or not they're successful is a different story but sometimes we are thankful that people do even go to the effort of wearing clothes even if said clothes don't fit so well I'm thinking of Walmart images coming through here so charisma is very difficult to play low charisma I tend to rely on low charisma as uh, in, in role playing anyway as a physical characteristic rather than a sociable characteristic simply because if you have a character who is like house md unless they are brilliant they're going to irritate the party they're going to irritate the npcs they interact with and that could derail the entire game so i would definitely definitely look at avoiding that Next question. Where are we? Where are we? Next question. Emma Fries, you're lucky I saw it. Please put your question in caps. But your question is, how do you go about intimidating with low charisma but high strength? Does that sound like something a DM could allow? It is entirely up to your DM. However, there is a section in the rulebook which does say that you can swap out the attribute that you are calling for in terms of your uh, check based upon the circumstance. So there is a section in the book, it's, it's in the player's handbook or it's in the DMG somewhere, I read it the other day, where you might have intimidation and next to it written charisma, but the DM is entirely, entirely, entirely within their rights to swap it out for strength or perhaps for intelligence if the player is trying to manipulate the character um the npc if the pc is trying to manipulate the P uh, npc they could use intimate intelligence for intimidation there are a lot of mitigating circumstances however it is also an option for the dm to enforce raw rules as written in which case they don't necessarily need to apply that so then they could make the ruling it's charisma based because it's charisma based and you're big and strong but you don't know how to ask questions. And you might stand there being absolutely terrifying, 
But if you don't know how to ask questions, if you don't know how to get the right response, all that you do is entrench defiance. So if you look at, for example, Darth Vader versus Princess Leia, he is big, he is intimidating, but he does not succeed in terms of getting any information out of her by using his strength. Who gets information out of her? Grand Moff Tarkin. He's not physically present, but he has a high charisma, or at least there is a certain command that he has, a certain um, position and status that he has that would allow him to do that. So there is an argument for and there's an argument against. It does depend entirely on your DM. Next question. Uh, da, 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 da. Brittany Silverton says, how do you deal with groups where only half the PCs are into roleplay and the other half is more action focused? Brittany, it's a great question. And it is a question that comes up quite often because roleplaying does have that definite split. There are those that like maps, there are those that like battle, there are those that like to optimize their characters for combat, and there are those who prefer role-playing. It's tricky. If you have a good GM, they will find a balance where they try to get both situations in. If you look at the formula for creating an adventure, and I say formula in inverted commas, I know I love formulas. Oh, you need to have three of these, and you need to have 12 of those, and it's going to take this long. If you look at the formula, in a given hour, you have the capacity for half an hour of dialogue and half an hour of combat if you have a party of four people who are role-playing very quickly and who are rolling their dice in combat very quickly. So, in theory, you could quite easily go half and half and half and half. It doesn't often happen that way, and I know I've had sessions where there have been no combat in them whatsoever because the role-playing has been so heavy. It is up to the GM to try and find a balance. And the unfortunate reality is if the players who are technical like everybody to be technical, if they like everybody to be focused on optimizing their characters, they are going to get frustrated with players like myself, for example, who don't see the mechanical side of the game, but who see the story side of the game. So the characters have got weird skills, weird abilities, weird traits and things that doesn't necessarily help advance combat, but help advance the narrative. So they will get to that point if they are technically minded, in which case it is best to split the party and the player base and run two separate games. Let the technicals have their wargaming basically, and let the role players have their book writing club, and bingo, you've got a happy space where neither feels the pressure of the other. That's if it's an, at an extreme. And sometimes these do go to extremes, so bear that in mind. Uh, right, there was a gigantic question that I saw coming through, but I've missed it. So I'm, I'm, I'm asked them that they would repost again. Dragonbane67 says, What is your advice for making cool monsters? Giant toids would be really helpful. But anything else would be as well. Thank you so much, Guy. Have a great day. Thank you, Dragonbane67. You too. I hope you do as well. Now, in terms of creating monsters, in terms of creating giant monsters too, I am going to do a little bit of self-promotion, but I kind of feel like that's justified considering that it is my channel. For a module that I have released last month for my Patreons, I needed to create dinosaurs. Now, when I say create dinosaurs, I mean create dinosaurs. This was now for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but the principle will apply for whatever kind of role-playing game you are running, assuming that they don't have this particular monster. So, and I'm just busy pulling it up now. Boom. No, let's not do that one. Sorry, give me a second. So I had to create dinosaurs. Now, the dinosaurs that were listed in the existing uh, module... Uh, there's this existing rule book anyway, were kind of small and pathetic and didn't cover the scope of the dinosaurs that I wanted it to cover. So I had to create my own and I'm going to show you very quickly because I don't want it to take too long. I'm going to show you very quickly how I did it. So I am in World Anvil, our world content creator of choice, World Anvil. If you haven't got an account, subscribe to them today or watch next week's campaign creator series where I'm giving you 20% off a subscription to World Anvil. Not that you need it, by the way. You can access World Anvil free. There is a free version, nonetheless. So I had to create these dinosaurs. Now, when I was creating gigantic dinosaurs, 
I needed to solve how could you ride them and what would happen if they attacked. So I had to, to look at that. So you want to look at that. Then here's Alamosaurus. Alamosaurus is one of the giant sauropods. It's not the biggest, definitely not the biggest, but it is a giant sauropod. So I needed to come and tweak. There was no stats for an Alamosaur in any of the rule books that I came across. So I needed to stat it up. And what I did was I said, okay, well, let's take it to a point where it starts to get much more interesting than just what's in the book. So I added in this option called lean. Now I have had the fortunate benefit, gift, experience of being very close to elephants for a good part of my professional career. Elephants have a tendency to lean on things. They don't charge into walls and things. They just lean on them and destroy them because of their weight. So I added a lean option that the creature can make an attack roll to hit. I'm just going to roll that quickly. And this is a then world anvil, which I quite like. So 28. It leans against the wall and it deals 57 points of damage to that wall, which will knock down most walls. Uh, this attack can only be made against structures. So when you're going about creating giant creatures, think about what they would add or what advantages you could add from a story perspective. Now, I also added here damage vulnerabilities that it takes 3d20 damage per 10 foot falling rather than the average 1d6. Why? If this drops 20 feet, for it, even though it is so big, its reach is probably 20 feet or more, that is a significant amount of damage, but more importantly, there is a significant amount of mass landing on these joints and these ligaments and things. And that will take significant amounts of damage. If you drop an ant off of a building and you drop a human off of the building, the human takes more damage. So that's something that I added in there. Then in terms of riding the creature, like I said, I had to come up with rules. What happens when you're riding a gargantuan creature and it makes an attack? If this thing makes its attack, which according to scientists, it would rear up on its back legs and come crashing down with its front legs, um, everybody who's riding on it is now 90 degrees to the ground. So something to bear in mind. If you go for something slightly smaller, I think, where was it? I put in a T-Rex here somewhere. There is a T-Rex in, there we go. So there is a T-Rex that does exist in the Monsters Manual. Again, I felt it didn't do enough. So there's the normal to hit. Does it bite you? It hits an armor class of 11. It does 24 that points of damage. But unless you escape a grapple check, it continues to eat you as it can, dealing 21 points of damage this round. So that's not in the book. It's much more savage. It's much more difficult. So I increased the challenge rating. It's got a lot of hit points. It's got lots of strength and all that kind of stuff. So when you look at monsters, gigantic monsters, I always think it's about looking at what is the impact against a medium-sized creature. And that is worth adding into your game and comparing, I think anyway, as to the whole uh, character creation process. And I'm sure there's, that, I mean, there's probably videos that run this entire thing in much better detail than I am at the moment. Okay, pause your questions, if you please. We have reached the hour. The hour, the bell tolls upon the hour, for we said we would release another winner, another winner, oh, another winner. So please hold your questions, hold your questions uh, for now, and uh, we will come back to, to your questions a little bit later on. We are going to give away another one of these dice. I love dice. I don't know why, why do we love dice as humans? I was having dinner last night with a friend of mine who did not know about role playing from Japan. Um, and um, I had my backpack with me as one does. And I just happened to have some dice in there. And I was like, oh, um, yeah, we role play and this is what we use. These are the dice we use. Um, and he couldn't really understand how it works. So I said, okay, well, look. Um, take the D20 and let's say you're driving a car and uh, a dog jumps out in front of you. Roll a d20 above 10 to, um, roll the d20 above 10 to succeed. And uh, if you fail, you hit the dog. So he rolled and he rolled a 13. So he, you know, missed the, uh, missed the dog. And he had a lot of fun doing it. And of course, that, 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 that hopefully will get him to join role playing. Anyway, it was glad that we had, that we had di uh, dice there. Right. Wait, what's this? Stop ignoring Twitch. 
Why am I ignoring Twitch? I don't think I'm ignoring Twitch. I'm asking uh, whatever question I see popping up. If I've only been doing YouTube so far, I do apologize. Um, I thought I was answering some Twitch questions. Anyway, I will try and pay better attention to Twitch. I apologize if I was not paying attention to you. Um, so there we go. Right, winner. Winner, 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 winner. Let's go over to the screen here. Now, if Centurion 19 wins again, I'm going to re-roll. I'm not going to send you two sets of dice. Um, so, so, so there we are. I probably should have mentioned that in the terms and conditions or whatever it is. Anyway, so let's go forward slash roll. Drum roll, if you please. 1D 381. Is that correct? 381? Uh, yes, it is. And have we got a drum roll? Have we got a drum roll? Um, I'm madly, mildly confused, says Joel Breadmaker. So am I. Don't worry. That's my perpetual life. And here we go. Three, two, one. Finger of Doom says it is number 249. 249. Let's scrub up. 249 is... Eligos. Eligos. Eligos is our winner number two. Eligos, that is Devil Hellion. Eligos, you are our winner number two. So well done to Eligos uh, for winning the second set of dice. There you go. <laughs> the dog is toast, says uh, four zero zero. There we go. Eligos, well done for that. You have a week to tell me what color do you want? Uh, blue? orange or pink first person to ask for the color gets the color that's how it works okay that was that now 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 i'm busy working through these things okay so we are we are getting there we are getting there uh hold your questions for now please um i will i will come back to them shortly so stay with us uh Gen Con. Gen Con. We're talking Gen Con. Why are we talking Gen Con so far in advance? You might be wondering. Gen Con is in August, the 1st to the 4th of August, as a matter of fact. The 1st to the 4th of August in Indianapolis, in the US of A. There seem to be a lot of people going on Twitch. We actually have um, Fantasy Grounds. Thank you. I'm coming to you, Fantasy Grounds. I'm coming to you next. Watch this space. But Fantasy Grounds, thank you for that. Um, Gen Con is in the US. Lots of people seem to be going. We have a channel just on our... Uh, well, we have a server on our channel. We have a channel on our server, um, however the nomenclature goes. I think it's a channel on our server dedicated to Gen Con 2019 because we're trying to make it as much of an event as humanly possible um, to be one to be remembered and enjoyed. Part of that is that we are hosting, we are running a couple seminars at Gen Con this year. We're running two. I'm on a whole bunch of other panels and things, so bear that in mind as well. Those I don't yet have the details for, but Sable Dice is going to be running a show um, on the Friday, I believe it is. So we'll be playing a Sable Dice show there. I don't know what game we're going to be running. I don't even know who's going to be running it, to be perfectly honest with you, but we are going to be there. But we have two seminars. Now, why am I telling you this? Why am I giving you this information on the 11th of May? Well, quite simply, I'm going to cut to their website. Quite simply, there's only 80 days. Ah, 80 days. I mean, that's crazy. There are only 80 days. But the important thing is here. May 19th is when you can start to register if you have purchased your Gen Con badges. May 19th is when you can start to register for these events. Now, these are the two events that I will be running, Telling Good Stories, Insert a Giant Banana, which is a creative writing process. It is free to attend. Um, there is no cost involved there. Why do they align? I need to change the positioning that I'm in. Anyway, it is free to attend. There is no cost involved from that perspective. It is in the ICC, the main hall itself. There is seating for 250 people only. No more than that. In the past, I've run this event. I did it in Finland, in Tampere, at um, um, 
well, at that convention that I was running, uh, uh, present at Trecon. Uh, so that was there and we were full, 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 full for both of those seminars. So May 19th is when you can start registering for events. If you register for the event, you get a ticket to the event. If you arrive at Gen Con and you have not registered for the event, there may not be any seats available because they are trying to make it a ticketless, paperless system. So you have it on your phone and you kind of show it at the door or whatever it is, and boom, you are provided with access. So there's no queues to buying tickets and stuff. It's all done online. May 19th, so you have got a few days left to, to prepare yourself and then to go and book for these events if you want to. The other one is world building, where to start, that I am co-hosting with Janet from World Anvil. We're going to be looking at world building from that perspective. I believe they're going to be doing some amazing giveaways for World Anvil there as well, so watch out for that. Like I said, I will be at Save or Dice. So Gen Con, if you can make it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I will be there, the Web Goblin. Thanks to your guys' generous donations, will be there as well. Um, so Glenn Jackson, thank you. So Glenn has now taken over as our lead monster. So there you go. There you go. Um, thank you for that. There is this, uh, yeah, the, the, we're going to be doing all kinds of things at Gen Con. Find me. Do not keep away. There's the Discord server. Go and join the Discord server. Um, let's meet and chat and, and do some role playing or whatever it is that we're going to be doing. So lots of fun. Lots of fun going on there. Right. That is Gen Con done. I've got a, I'm just working through my list here of stuff. I, it's, it's really cool. Fantasy Grounds College, as you may or may not have seen, popped up very quickly and gave us an amazing donation, which is awesome. Um, for that, we do thank you. They have also been instrumental in helping me with, and you heard it here first, our latest channel affiliate. Our latest channel affiliate. Fantasy Grounds, the virtual tabletop of choice for how to be a great GM now, has become an affiliate with our channel. So now we have We've completed the, the, the sphere of role playing, if you like, from a, a channel perspective. And again, this is because of you guys, all of you guys watching, supporting, entering these competitions, uh, just being present, watching the videos on YouTube, commenting has created such a presence of how to be a great GM out there on the World Wide Web that we have had the capacity to go to people and say become an affiliate with us so we start to work together and we've chosen companies that we want to work together with as well so we've got q workshop for dice their dice are amazingly beautiful q workshop is now an affiliate fantasy grounds is now an affiliate you've watched me on twitch use fantasy grounds for a long time and I approached them and I said, look, this is a story. There was lots of backwards and forwards and there always is. And they've decided for the next six months anyway to be an affiliate with the channel. So you'll see their logos all over the place. A special video coming out on the 23rd of, of uh, March because they're also running a Kickstarter for a new and improved Fantasy Grounds VTT. Uh, so that's going to be coming up. Um, we've got World Anvil for our World Aggregator. That's a long-running partnership that we've had with them. We've got Dungeon Fog for their map-making software. And I'm going to now just quietly say Project Deos. Project Deos. I say nothing, but Project Deos. That's with Dungeon Fog. Um, so we've got Dungeon Fog for maps. We've got World Anvil for our worlds. We've got... Q workshop for our dice. We now have Fantasy Grounds for our VTT. We have our own platform, which is RPG Table Finder. That's for finding your own tables. So the, and creating your own role playing groups and all that kind of stuff. So it's a full spectrum. And then on top of that, I'll be running the Ghosts of Saltmarsh for Dungeons and Dragons, who effectively are now our role-playing game of choice as well so that kind of rounds out at least that's for the next six months anyway that rounds out the general picture so it's exceptionally exceptionally uh amazing to be in this place where we're recognized by such industry leaders and it is thanks to you guys and your support 
long story, as usual, long, long, long story. I'm sorry I bored some of you to, 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 to tears there. But what I wanted to talk about very, very quickly and to show you a soupçon, a sample, a very small little bit of insight into what uh, Fantasy Grounds College has done, uh, has helped us achieve, what we have managed to achieve in terms of running the Ghost of Salt Marsh game. Now, I will be doing a whole in-depth tutorial on this later on on the channel, but Ghost of Salt Marsh ostensibly has a lot of nautical elements. Ship combat is part of the book, which is great for those of us who have wanted to have ship combat. I know it was released, I think, in not in Volo's guide, but in one of the earlier guides. I don't have all of those books. I, Ghost, Ghost of Salt Marsh is the first expansion that I've got from Wizards because they gave it to me. Nonetheless, it, it provides us with naval combat rules. And one of the things that we wanted to do was we said, OK, well, how do we keep track of it? Because of the way that they've put the whole thing together, it's very cool, it's very dynamic, but it can be quite heavy to track. So what can we do to best utilize our um, space, to best make use of Fantasy Grounds? So I'm not an expert at it by any means. I went to Fantasy Grounds College and I said, I need help if you please. Um, so there we go. Um, Ryan Nine first to punch the new monster. There we go. Thanks, Ryan, for that. Uh, Raven uh, for punching the monster. Uh, five hit points down. Yes. Only 1,995 to go. There you are. Now, uh, yes, yeah, so we went to Fantasy Grounds College and yesterday someone jumped on board and spent an hour with us. Brian was his name, so thank you to Brian uh, to try and solve this. I'm going to cut over now to Fantasy Grounds. I've got it here. Um, my dice are actually keying out, so anyway. What we needed was we needed a way for ships to be able to operate and for ship combat to happen. One of the things that I think that Ghost of Salt Marsh did really well was to give us the platform how, for how does combat work. One of the things that I think that could be a potential issue, especially because I am running it as a live stream on the 25th of May, 1 p.m. Pacific time, by the way, on the D&D Twitch channel. So that's twitch.tv forward slash D&D, by the way. That's where I'm running it. It will obviously run on Great Gym as well. I think they're hosting us. Anyway, is I needed to make ship combat faster. So I abstracted a little bit. I worked with Dead Aussie Gamer. He joined me as well for some play testing of some rules that I have been writing that they are an addition to Ghosts of Salt Marsh. It's a supplement for the supplement, I suppose you could say, but it's about making combat a little bit faster. Could we do it though in Fantasy Grounds? And the answer was, I think, an emphatic yes. That was supposed, there we go, that brings up this. What is this? This is me in the way of what I'm wanting to show, so I'm going to move myself over there. Good. Right, so this is a template that I have designed to allow for ship combat to happen. Now, because ship combat has been discussed in other books, I can give you a little bit of a spoiler of how it works in Ghosts of Salt Marsh. And uh, I do hope that um, this is of interest to you, um, so that you're not completely, completely bored. Um, there is someone with a Japanese name, Lili... Uh, and that's as far as I go because I don't recognize that one. You're no. Oh, God. Anyway, thank you for <laughs> for your name uh, and for your comments. I do do appreciate that. Um, so there we go. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right. I will be coming to questions shortly. So this is the layout that we have worked out for Ghosts of Salt Marsh. And what it allows you to do is in Ghosts of Salt Marsh, the ships have got the actual value itself. They've got a whole value themselves, but then they have components. Uh, in this case, they have helm, they have sails, they have ballista, and they have mangonels, which are the weapons that the ships are uh, using. So we've designed this in Fantasy Grounds. I think it looks quite pretty. Uh, this is a Fantasy Grounds Photoshop mashup type of thing. So that when, let's say, we go to our combat tracker, Combat track is not as neat as, as, I, as I would like it to be, but it is there nonetheless. So if we go to, let's just go to the next ship who's attacking. So this is uh, the Thunder's Bite. The Thunder's Bite, this is the little ship here. Thunder's Bite is going to attack our um, Red Falcon over here. So it can attack as per usual. I can drag it onto, let's say it's targeting the shield, the shields, the sails. 
I can drag it onto the sails. It now makes an attack against the sails. Now you can't see me because I'm blocking once again. I'm going to move over here. Uh, there you can see it says hit. So it has hit the sails and I'm not going to roll the damage against those sails right there. And it will now keep track. So if I go to the Red Falcon sails, which are down here, it shows me that it's taken 18 points of damage of their 50. Once the sails have been destroyed, the ship loses speed and all that kind of stuff. I also have some other stuff down here, which I'm not going to go into in today's video because that is something else to look at. Um, I'm just saying that we may or may not have a working ship's compass or wind direction. We have a rangefinder, which we'll be using. But generally speaking, this is how we're going to be using the fantasy grounds anyway for combat. So what I what I wanted to, the reason why I was talking about all of this nonsense in the first place is because Fantasy Grounds College, who has no affiliation with Fantasy Grounds itself, it's just a collection of people who've got together and who um, really love the software, helped me to figure all of this out so that it could be this really cool, really interactive space, specifically for my players to enjoy, as well as for you guys to watch at home and uh, to be able to visualize and see what's going on. Anyway, it should be a lot of fun, that show. We've got some amazing characters that are coming through. Of a party of five, we have one human. The rest are all different races. Um, so I really, really, really enjoy that. Right, question time. We're going to do questions until... Let's do questions for 10 minutes until half an hour. And then we will do the final giveaway. And then creative writing after that. I might need oil for my chair. Okay, so questions, 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 if you please. Questions, questions, questions. If you please. Right. Um, you see, the questions are coming through from, from YouTube. There's nothing coming from Twitch. And I get accused of ignoring Twitch. Um, so the, 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 the questions that come through. Um, right. So Twitch. Vow. Should, there's the block. That block has been sitting there for a long time. I'm going to go to that one first. And I'm going to come to Stranger's question. Right. Super Zorius says... I had just finished my third session of my first campaign as a GM. Bravo, bravo, bravo. I asked after the session what they expected and what do they think their characters want to achieve. I ended up feeling awful as they don't want to take part in character and story development. They just argued and demanded more combat when I told them it was a role-playing based campaign. Since nice, uh, some nice people from Twit uh, from <laughs> some nice people from Twitch advised me sit and talk with them. How should I do it? Super Zorius, you have combat players and you want to be a narrative GM. Yes, sit and talk with them. Figure out what is it that they like about role playing and what is it that they don't like role playing. Don't talk about your campaign, don't talk about your story, don't talk about what you figured out. Figure out what type of game they play. I would also suggest that you don't necessarily talk to them as a group. Because you will start to get group mentality and some will start to override others. I would chat to them individually. Maybe even use a third party thing like some kind of chat program. WeChat, WhatsApp, Line. Pick a, pick a communication piece of technology. Chat to them about what do they like about role playing. So that's what you should ask them. What do you like about role playing? And if they say, well, what do you mean? Do you like combat? Do you like the tactical elements of um, running through a scenario? Do you like problem solving? Do you like puzzles? Do you like riddles? Do you like interacting with NPCs? Do you like big stories or do you prefer more combat focused stuff? It's important to unpack what your players want before you go any further. So although you've run three sessions as a GM, that, by the way, is a significant achievement, and I applaud you for it, your players may not simply want a narrative-based game. They may just want combat scenarios. They are Diablo players. They are not story players. In which case, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. You're faced with two choices. Either you run a combat-based game, where you try to make the combats as interesting as possible for yourself, build in a little bit of story, but not a lot of story. Make sure that there's more tactical stuff involved. It really requires you to up your game. Or 
simply let somebody else GM and you can participate as a player or find a different group. I am not a tactical player. I am not a combat tactical player in the slightest. If I discover that I have a player at my table who's all about the tactics, who's all about the combat, they are going to get very bored. Of course, I have the luxury of having queues of people wanting to play in my games, but I haven't always had that opportunity. I have always had the opportunity, however, of saying, you know what? It's not for me. That's not my kind of role playing. I don't role play. I don't play Warhammer 40k. Uh, tabletop. I used to, but it was combat, combat, combat. There was very little narrative. And when they would bring out, oh, it's a campaign where I would get excited that there was a pros prospect of role playing. I then realized that it was just different battle scenarios, which is interesting and diverting as a tabletop war game, but not as a role playing game. So each has their space. Each has their position. You need to find your space and your position. So um, that would be my advice to you. Chat to them individually. See what they want, really want from their role playing game and then figure out how to move forward. Not happy advice, I'm afraid, but it is what it is. Right, a question from you. Do you make a barbarian that doesn't come from a tribe? As it popped up, wait, what, 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 what? Um, do you make a barbarian that doesn't come from a tribe and like killing? How do you make a barbarian that doesn't come from a tribe and like killing? So they don't come from a tribe and they don't like killing, or they don't come from a tribe, but they do like killing. Barbarians don't necessarily have to come from tribes necessarily. Barbarians could come from any kind of situation. You could argue that a gladiator who is fighting in the arena is a barbarian because they go into a blood rage or a blood frenzy when they start to get beaten up. Pain triggers that in them. The Hulk, for example, is a barbarian without any shadow of a doubt. And he didn't grow up in a tribe that was naturally or inherently violent or vicious. It's just what happens when the fight or flight hormones of the person kick in. So you could certainly ignore the fact that they come from a tribe or they don't come from a tribe and have that as their, their build. If they also don't like killing, that's absolutely, absolutely fine as well. It could be simply a barbarian who was raised by a civil society who looks down upon those kinds of things. And as a result, that is what they have become. I would then look to the defensive options where the barbarian can absorb damage, where they can look after their party members and things like that. So they won't initiate combat, but if combat is initiated, they will defend those that they care about. So you're looking at the protector type in terms of personality types, you're looking at someone who looks after the party rather than who attacks the party, attacks the enemies and the like. So that's an option for you. Uh, right. Uh, Seriana asks the question from Twitch. Seriana asks the question, when playing in a large party, eight players, whew, how do you know when to push your own character's needs and wants and when to back off to let others take center stage? When characters need when characters needs clash. Uh, when characters needs clash, is it okay to have a character conflict or argument? It's a great question. Eight players is huge. That's a massive, a massive amount of people playing, and it does happen from time to time. It certainly does. I'm not saying it doesn't. Firstly, I would in this instance, I would keep track of the other characters' interactions. Watch to see, okay, is the GM dividing time up equally with all of you? Yes. I would also, also engage with your fellow PCs as a PC. So have your character approach the others and say, I have a need, but I will require your assistance. Would you be willing to support me in my cause? Engage with them. Ask them. There's no better way to get a player to give you approval than to get the player to get their PC to give your PC approval. It's in-game interaction, it's in-game role-playing, and it allows you to get inside their head as well. So I would look at it from that perspective. I would also then, by judging and by seeing that your fellow players are interested in going on this quest with you, I would allow that to happen. In terms of inter-party conflict, yes, I would do that, but I would try and resolve it as quickly as possible. So have it... Again, approach the player first and see and make sure that it is something that they are willing and happy to do and then start to play through it. Conflict doesn't just happen straight away. 
Unless you're playing this very hot-headed, very direct barbarian, it is unlikely that conflict will just suddenly happen. Usually there'll be a little bit of tension, so a bit of backbiting, a little bit of setup. It takes a few sentences, a few little words of action to happen in your big group, but in session one, you've set up that there is animosity between the two. Session four, you push that animosity to the next level. Oh, I push Throthgar backwards. You don't know what you're doing. You're wasting our time. Throthgar pushes back. We scowl at each other, but then we move on. Session 10, that's it. I've had enough with you. I challenge you to a duel. Then you can bring it to a head. Then you can make it happen. Once it's happened, though, follow Hollywood trope. Follow the fact that once the battle is over, the one who wins needs to be the bigger person. They need to then step forward and extend their hand saying, you fought well. Let us not be enemies. Let us find common ground that we might unite in our cause in defeating so-and-so. Look at it from that perspective. And what it does is it tells a great little side story. It tells us a great character development story. It doesn't get in the way of the other players' stories. It doesn't get in the way of the GM's plot. And it allows your two characters to come together and have a lot of fun. So that would be my advice there. That would be my advice there. Okie dokes. Next question. Wolvi Zandalari. Hello, Wolvi Zandalari. Uh, I hope you got my private message uh, request from you. Nonetheless, is there a limit to how much a party should add their own flair to a campaign? I'm playing Horde of the Dragon Queen and we're making a chicken army. Horde of the Chicken Queen. Next question. <laughs> Players should have as much agency as the GM wants them to have. You should look at your GM and see as the GM, one of the GMs who have crafted their world, who's very serious about playing Horde of the Dragon Queen, is making sure that they're running every point. In which case, then, what you're doing is basically derailing it. And derailing it, derailing it is the new term I'm going to be using from now on for derailing, but in a role-playing game. You're derailing the game in terms of the GM's purpose and intent. If the GM, however, is allowing you to create your chicken army and is actually giving you several... I nearly said a bad word live. Uh, is giving you several cock rules as the leaders of the hens, then yes, absolutely fine. Go with it, let it roll. But uh, yeah, until then, I would just check with your GM. Are they happy doing it? In which case, it's absolutely fine. When I was running Mines of Fandelvia, this is an old story and you've probably all heard it. But when I was running Mines of Fandelvia, the adventure, preset adventure for introduction to Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. When I was running that, my characters tied a goblin that they took prisoner in the very first encounter to a stick and used him basically as a trap detector. They would just tap the walls and the floors and the ceilings as they walked forward with the goblin. If he screamed or if a trap triggered, well, then they knew that it was a trap and could avoid it. It was quite an ingenious option. It made the entire situation a little bit lighter and more humorous than it was, but I was happy with that because my players came up with that idea and they seemed happy with that kind of frivolous and frivolity that uh, came as a result. How are we looking for time? I'm going to go another three minutes. Uh, we've still got one more giveaway to do, and we have the creative writing to, to do as well. Next question. I don't see any questions from Twitch. On my screen at the moment, I've got nothing from Twitch. I've only got one from Omen La from YouTube. Do you have any advice for necromancers who start building up their undead horde, but feel like their sheer amount of tokens unbalances encounters and overshadows the other players? Necromancers have always had this problem. Always, 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 always had this problem. Necromancers, again, if you look at things like Diablo, where the necromancer has this horde of things running around, I would first and foremost to go to the GM and say, listen, I've got 20 creatures here, or I've got 10 creatures here. They're all doing the same kind of thing. Please look at the mass combat rules in the DMG. The Dungeon Master's Guide has a section on running combat for multiple creatures that are clustered in a similar combat skill space 
as a single die roll rather than as multiple die rolls. So that is definitely something to look at. It's a bit of broad strokes, bad statistical math type averaging, but it certainly increases the speed. Instead of having 20 skeletons attack, you make one attack roll and you have worked out statistically the chances of those skeletons attacking and then you can just work out how many hit. So definitely, definitely, definitely have a look at that. It is something to think about. Uh, White Tiger 225 from Twitch says, how do you deal with a player who constantly worries when the stakes get high to the point he argues with other players because of stress? Hmm. Arguing with other players from a rules perspective or from a character? Does the character stress or does the player stress? If the player stresses, you need to tell... And if, uh, well, uh, mm, let me back up. Do the other players feel that the character, that the player is doing this and that the player is enforcing their requirements and stress issues onto the other players? Or is it an amusing thing that they do that everyone just ignores, but it happens anyway? If the players themselves are being upset by the character, the other players' actions, the stressful players' actions, if they're getting anno annoyed by it, if they're getting irritated by it, it is definitely something that you're going to need to address with that player and say, listen, we understand it's awesome that you're getting so involved in the game. It's awesome that you're getting so invested in the game. However, you must stop telling the other players what to do. I can help you as the game master because every time you try and tell another player what to do, I will raise a finger, I will throw a dice, I will give you negative inspiration, I will do something to help you realize what you are doing and make you a better human being. That's option one. Hopefully they will take that. If I had someone who would help me in terms of reducing the amount of safe words I have, that would be brilliant. Preferably not by throwing dice at me, but perhaps by raising a finger saying, ah, 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 you have used that word already in a sentence. Use a different word, please. We are improving vocabulary, not devolving into single monosyllabic monsters. That would be great. The alternative is if they say, well, it's just what I do when I get stressed. Yeah, if you're irritating the other players, arrivederci, it's time for you to find a different group. It, it's so disruptive. It sounds like it's, it's a nightmare. So definitely, definitely something to look at. Uh, right. Uh, no more questions for now. No more questions for now. No more questions for now. I apologize if you're asking questions. Um, no more questions for now. We will come back to it. Um, I see there are some good questions there. But let's come back to it uh, when we are there. I see that someone is talking about the fluster cluck uh, that would happen with a horde of chickens. The fluster cluck. I do like that. Uh, yes, horde of chickens. Bad. <coughs> Right, now, last giveaway or creative writing first. Last giveaway or creative writing first. You know what, I'm going to do the last giveaway because I don't want us to run out of time and the creative writing can always, of course, roll over into something that you guys are doing. So, again, I bring these up. The last, the last one of these to be given away. Oh, oh, oh. Um, the last one of these to be given away will go to now I'm in the way again now I'm in the way I just can't get it right can I uh, would you please go and hide over there in the corner you <laughs> right forward slash roll 1d 381 drum roll if we can drum roll brum the fluster cluck. There we go. The fluster cluck. Super Zorus, how can you participate in the next giveaway? How can you participate in the next giveaway? Watch my videos on YouTube. Watch my videos on YouTube. I see you are on Twitch. So if you find us on YouTube, otherwise someone can put the link in the uh, chat for Twitch. Uh, if you please find my videos on YouTube and you'll see I periodically give away bits and pieces. Not very often, I don't think, but it does happen. Anyway, the final winner in the Q Workshop Dice Giveaway. And I can ask them for more dice to give away, by the way. I can do that. It's in my power. Anyway, let's have a look. The final winner is number 63. 63, 63. 
63 up the list we go and there is 63 athena gary athena gary you are our winner you are our third winner athena gary the winner is athena gary that's athena gary who posted on the 8th of may 8th of may athena gary you are our third winner i am so so sorry to those of you who entered and did not win but there were so many there were so many people who entered and who you know it is there but nonetheless uh, the winners all uh, have been have been chosen now athena gary our last winner um very short time frame for the competition to run as well but i thought you know what let's take a chance so yeah there we go there we go um i put little hearts next to every uh, tweet that i logged i hope um nonetheless yes so athena gary if you are in the chat if you are watching today's show there we are ah says athena gary athena gary tweet me and link unusual gaming please so that they can see that they're getting their money's worth which color which color do you want blue blue yellow orange or pink which one of the three colors send it through please send it through if you uh can as fast as you can that would be fantastic well done for winning that and for tweeting i do thank you okay that was exciting that was exciting i can put it all, t take it off my list and save the excel document so that i don't forget who won because that would be a thing Anyway, turn green with envy. Turn green with envy, white tiger. There we go. Pink, says Athena Gary. Yes, Athena, thank you. Pink, I like, I like that. Please, 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 for trackability, send me a tweet. You know how to do that. And just tag unusual dice. You will be getting your pink dice coming through. Um, tag me in a tweet, please. And then I will get hold of you and I will PM you. I hope I can PM you. So you can send me all of your details. I will need your details there. So please do that. The pink one, she is yours. Okay. Um, right. Done and dusted. Well done. Creative writing. Creative writing. Creative writing is a little section that we do, for those of you that don't know. Creative writing takes place uh, in the show from time to time. And uh, it's where you get to flex your creative muscles. Now, generally, I try and do a creative writing exercise that I used to do in my creative writing classes that I used to run when I was a lecturer. And um, they help you to think about your character or think about your narrative in a slightly different way or perhaps in a way that you haven't anticipated before. Drop your thoughts into the chat. You are limited down to 200 words or so, so you can't write books, unfortunately, but that is a good thing. That is a good thing. Uh, drink Gamer Prep. Pre what? Get, blah, 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 blah. Let me get this right, otherwise I'm going to look like a complete monster. Um, drink Game Repeat is raiding with a party of four. Thank you for that uh, drink game repeat. I saw your entry in the uh, Twitter entries. It was there. Uh, but uh, yes, the prizes have gone to those who were chosen by randomly. Drink game repeat. Thank you, Raven9. I can't... I've got to move it somewhere else because it's... it's anyway, you, you, you know me. You know me. Right. See, that's my safe word for today. Right, right, right. Let's move right. Let's move. I hate safe words. They are simply the brain's way of operating without thinking. Creative writing. The creative writing challenge. The creative writing challenge is this. For a character, doesn't have to be your character. It's just a character, whether that's an NPC or a PC, for a character in one of your games. Any setting. Any setting. I want you to list an object and I want you to describe that object that fits under the title of something borrowed. What was borrowed? What was borrowed for your character? Describe it as best you can so that I get a sense of the object. Now, to give you an example, let us say, well, why not? I borrowed these dice. The dice are uh, icy blue, 
and transparent, semi-transparent. They remind me of ice cubes in a gin and tonic. They have no smell to them other than the smell of the cardboard box that they came in, which is, with right angles, quite sharp to the touch. Something like that. Give me some descriptions of something borrowed for your character. If it's a sword, if it's a piece of armour, nonetheless, let us know. Drop your comments into the chat. Uh, stranger, thank you. Good night. Sleep well. Uh, we will see you next week, I hope. Uh, Matthew Kiva, thank you for inspiring me. Absolutely my pleasure. Um, happy to do that. Happy, 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 happy to do that. That's great feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, can you give us some tasting notes? No, I cannot give you any tasting notes. I posted a picture with a dice on Twitter, as a matter of fact, with the dice in my mouth. Hmm. Generally, I avoid putting dice in my mouth. You know where they've been. Anyway. All right. Any any options coming through? Do, we, do, do people want creative writing this week? Do they want creative writing? Or do we want more questions? That's a question I should have asked. Um, so there we are. Again, as Stranger points out, please uh, make sure to like the stream if you are watching. Uh, where do you post the story? Will be posted here. Uh, post it here, please. Uh, posted in the chat, whatever chat you, you happen to be in. Something borrowed there, portentous, right, something borrowed. When I was five, I borrowed my next door neighbor's mother. She didn't beat me or get drunk. I'm 49 now and I haven't given her back. <laughs> well, there we go. That's interestingly dark. Uh, you borrowed your next door neighbor's mother. She didn't beat me or get drunk. I'm 49 now and I haven't given her back. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You writes, a colourful scarf borrowed with a pattern of X's across it. You, I want you to take that description further. Why was a colourful bor scarf borrowed? What does it remind you of? And how does it feel? Give me a textural suggestion, if you please. Durakan says, my character borrows his power over flames of the demoness that possesses him. He feels the heat, but the demoness protects him. Aha, aha, that's interesting. What does he feel about the demoness, this character? How does, how does he feel about the demoness? That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. Uh, Faliona, that's a question... Uh, is that a moral question? I'm going to come back to it, so paste it a little bit later on, if you please, as soon as we've finished. Um, uh, Tanner writes fried chicken leg. I assume you're still on the fluster cluck. Uh, Nora Max says, that small glass vial, so delicate yet so very important. The life was shared with Silas and he promised to reply, uh, repay the invaluable debt. Sadly, he was burned at the stake for illegal casting. <laughs> Rip wizard. <laughs> a glimmer of hope, a radiant shine of peace in corporeal and with the weight of humanity. I, the necromancer, have borrowed the paladin's faith. Turns out causing a crisis of faith isn't actually helpful, says Alistair Lockhart. I like that. Um, Jarl Breadmaker, my creative juices aren't flowing today. It happens. It really does. Something borrowed, says Yong Yong Grim. A well-worn bunch of papers torn from a book. The pages contain the words of common folktale about a knight, and the words are a reminder of importance of bravery and honour. That is lovely. That is lovely. Lance Pickett says, When I was at my lowest, broken and near death, you gave me the last of your water, so sweet and cool. I have never had the chance to return the kindness you lent. So I give you, I give my love in kind. Wow, that's deep. That's nice. That's lovely. Uh, the scarf borrowed was from his mother, who he had to leave for his family's uh, protection. It reminds him of home, something he hasn't had in a while. It is soft and warm and always feels comforting in the storm. There we go. And I can relate to that. I haven't uh, been home to my family for two years since moving to Japan, but that will change in November. Lovely. Okay, so some great options coming through. 
do you see how when you expand upon the object, it's not just something borrowed, it's something borrowed with attachments, a wooden bowl with a carved handle, um, you know, it, it, there's a splinter that was in that bowl. It gives you more. It gives you as the creator more uh, to work with, to, to create stories with. Oftentimes I hear GMs and I hear players say, oh, I don't know what my character should say or I don't know how to roll, you know, I don't know what to talk about. Well, here is in a very quick space of time, something for your character to talk about. Terranatium is there writing about something borrowed as a golden ring, precious. Um, a tattered red cape says Raven Nyan. Uh, it feels silky, it has a weight to it. If you use your senses when you are describing an object and you just say something borrowed, would someone please stop talking about chicken? I am getting hungry. Anyway, uh, when you add these things together, when you start to, to describe and unpack something borrowed in this instance, there is also a connection. When something is borrowed, in theory, it should be returned. I lend you something, you borrow it, you give it back. What that does is it gives your character a link, or it gives your NPC a link that goes just beyond the object. So I quite like it in terms of using it as a tool when I'm GMing by saying, well, I'll, I'll lend you this, but I do expect it back. Now there's a connection between the NPC and the PC. They have to bring it back. There's an expectation. I can use that NPC later on to say, I have come seeking you. You borrowed my sword 20 years ago and you haven't returned it yet, you bastard. I want it back. So I can have it as a combat sequence. I can have it as a whole side adventure. I can have the object trying to get back to its master, AKA the Lord of the Rings. There is all kinds of things that under the, under the, the title of borrowed, that comes with that very simple word and bingo suddenly there's this whole connection there's this whole potential series of adventures that come out just from something borrowed so thank you to those of you who participated in today's writing uh, creative writing there will be more there will be more uh, next week as usual so there we are uh, we've got nine minutes left for questions nine minutes left if you have any questions Send them through. Now is your chance because we are running out of time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Any questions? I think we're still on something borrowed. Be wary of borrowing kenders. Yes. Be wary of borrowing halflings in general. Uh, right. There we go. Durakin asks question. Have you ever encountered and how would you handle a character that is possessed by another character who has different abilities? And sh they share control of the body. Oh, boy. It sounds like a lot of fun. And it sounds to me like that is a lot of uh, spirit battle. In Dungeons & Dragons, it would be will wisdom saving throws. Who has the greater wisdom to take control of the body? Um, I would handle it as two character sheets. Even though they're in the same body, I might say that the strength, the dexterity, and the constitution of the bodies remain the same. But wisdom, intelligence, and charisma would be dependent on each individual character. That is definitely something that I would do, simply because they are the, that is the entity that sits inside our heads is the, is the thing that generates our intelligence, our wisdom, and our charisma. The physical form, how well-defined our muscles are and the like, that is something that is based upon the shell, upon the actual flesh itself. So that would be my, my suggestion there. Faliona asks... You are an eyewitness to a violent crime. Okay, yes, I'm from South Africa. I have witnessed many violent crimes. A gang has robbed a bank. Yes, where the tax money is stored for funding the war against the undead. I see. Um, yes, okay. But instead of keeping the money for themselves, uh, the thief, I suppose, he donates it to the poor over flooded orphanage. The urchins and otherwise misfortunate from the heavy taxation that they now uh, cannot afford to feed, clothe and care for themselves. You know who the guilty party are. Will you go to the guards or let the less fortunate keep the money? I am afraid, Faliona, 
I am not the right person to ask. My alignment is lawful evil uh, through and through. I have seen the crime. I know that the crime was committed. I know who committed it. And I disagree with what they did with the money. I'm way too cutthroat for that. The orphans should voluntarily have surrendered the money back to the guards anyway, because if it is to fight against the undead, the money is better spent on arms and armour on those who can use it rather than on an orphanage where the children are, as you have already established, malnourished, malnutritioned, uneducated, and quite possibly not the best defence against the undead, whereas the guards and soldiers who have been trained to use the equipment are. So I'm afraid that's where I would sit. Is that an evil act? Perhaps, but I kind of feel like that's the better judgment call to make. I could be wrong. Please, disagree with me, prove your uh, case, make your case, and let's discuss and unpack that. That's a good moral uh, dilemma for people who have those kinds of things. I'm way too, 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 too um, pragmatic when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, right. Uh, next guy repost these. Can't you just rewatch them? Wait, what? These all sit, this show will sit on YouTube in perpetuity, so people can come back to that. Charles West says, Have you ever run the old horror RPG Chill by Pace Setter? Uh, thoughts if so. Cheers. Charles West, I have not run the old horror RPG chill. I have not. I have been given a great um, horror RPG written by a fan of the channel. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's on my bookshelf somewhere. Uh, it's behind my monitor. Uh, Creepy Pasta was the rule set that was sent through to me for a horror game. Lovely set of rules. Lovely game. Check it out, creepy pasta if you can. Uh, okay, and uh, next question. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. Next question. Um, bum, 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 bum. White Tiger two two five says, "What was your favorite place you lived in in terms of role playing? I mean, in terms of inspiring you to create." Wait. Uh, what was your favorite place you lived in in terms of role playing? I mean, in terms of inspiring you to create. Okay, so in other words, what what location has inspired me to create the most? I would have to say that that would would, without a shadow of a doubt, be the place where I grew up from about the age of ten to eighteen. Uh, so those were my formative years. That's where I really got into role playing. It was a little country village called Howick in the middle of an area of South Africa called the Midlands, which is idyllic green rolling hills. There are forests to go and explore and slay demons and slay dragons in. There was a big winding river that we used to go and swim in all the time, um, exploring and creating. A friend of mine had a large... Uh, farm holding area that we would go and climb down cliffs and cut our hands open and do all those kinds of crazy things but it was really the most the most formative in terms of um, just being out and about in the countryside I think and having a lot of fun whilst doing that so that that is in terms of giving me a base I suppose in terms of actually inspiring me Tokyo has certainly inspired me tremendously in terms of how I look at other cultures because it was such a culture shock. Having known nothing about Japanese culture outside of the very few kind of cinematic films that I had watched, when only with half interest anyway, uh, arriving here to see how the people operate, very different approach to life. And I think that that is something that feature films don't necessarily give us, is what is life like? So anyway, those are, those are, those are my answers there. Um, Michael Morris says, could we see some of your personal, could we see some of your personal tabletop creations? I'm not entirely sure what you mean, uh, Mr. Morris or Michael Morris, in terms of personal tabletop creations. In terms of tabletop role-playing games, um, I have not officially published anything yet, however... Um, I have released a book, The Complete Guide to Creating Epic Campaigns, which I have here, that you can find on our website. It is, it is, I suppose, insight into a tabletop creation, if you like. 
Um, there are the adventure modules that I release every month for the Patreons of the channel. That's the um, that comes out every month. Those are last month was a dinosaur focused adventure. The month before was arena combat style siege stuff. Uh, this month is a murder mystery investigation. And again, they're written, although they are written for for D&D 5th edition, they are also written in such a way that you can convert them to whatever system you might write. So there's that. Um, I am busy finishing a book for Dragon Turtle Games. Dragon Turtle Games is releasing a role-playing system called Carbon 2185. Carbon 2185. That is coming out uh, fairly soon, as a matter of fact. I was commissioned to write the rule book, the source book, for Tokyo, since I am here, that is coming out. That's a mega volume. Well, uh, my section anyway, I think is about 60 or 70 pages worth of text and rules and things on how to run a game in Tokyo based on my experiences here. Uh, so that's coming out. Uh, yes. And then, of course, there's the supplement for the Ghosts of Saltmarsh that will be releasing hopefully around the 25th of May once the show starts, because a lot of the rules that I have added in terms of making Ghosts of Saltmarsh work uh, from a, a broadcast perspective, from a, a live show perspective, are there. Um, and that will be coming out as well. So there are lots of options. There are, are, are lots of options um, for you to, to have a look at. Um, yes, right. Uh, not Sorry, not 8125. Uh, it's, it's, is it 8125? Dear God. Tell me that that's not the name. I'm sure it was 2185. 2185. Uh, if it is 8125, uh, I'm mistaken. Uh, I will have to correct myself on that one. There we go. There we go. So, yeah, I didn't see the comments. I was busy talking. I was busy answering. I didn't see the comments about my moral choice, whether it was what you guys would have gone with. Um, oh, I see you're trying to work out who is statistically better at fighting. <laughs> Technically, the orphans are improvised. Wait, what? You're going to use the orphans as weapons against the undead? That's crazy! Right. A uh, few more minutes. No, we're actually over time. I'm going to take one last question. And then that's it for this week's show. I thank you all for participating. And that last question is... I've only got YouTube here on my screen at the moment. That is from Reven Alexi. Reven Alexi. Will you ever answer stranger? You said you would earlier. Oh, God. Okay. What did stranger ask that I have missed? Stranger, I don't know if you're still here. I know you said you were going to go to bed. But uh, the question is, will you ever answer stranger? Since this is the last question, yes, I will answer stranger one day. Um, can I leave it like that? Can I leave it like that? Uh, I'm going to give you five seconds to ask that question again. Five, four, three. Wait, wait. That's... That's Stranger's question. Uh, wait, what? Oh, I love your... Oh, okay, okay. I see, I see, I see, I see. I love your someone wants something and is having trouble getting it. I've seen your one-shot builder about this. Yes, absolutely. But do you have any additional one-shot tips on this particular subject? One-shots are an option or an opportunity for you as the game master to try out different things. You can try out different narrative techniques. So let's say, for example, you want to run a horror where the feeling is horrific, where the players get all nervous and edgy. You can do that. You can try different systems. I'm going to run a one shot using the Lone Wolf RPG system, which is a D10 system, not a percentile, it's a D10. I, you can try different systems. You can try out different modifications. So what new rule subsets are you adding to a game? You can try out all of these different things within a one shot. But I would generally suggest that you don't try out more than one at a time. So if you're trying a different tone, use a system that you are incredibly familiar with so that you can use the system to help you to create that tone rather than trying to create the tone for a new system that you're learning at the same time. So stick to one of those options. Look at enhancements, but again, use the system that you're all familiar with. Use a new system and then play it as it is created. Don't try and add your own flair to it before you get used to it. I would suggest that that is the way in which one shots can really work from that perspective. 
from the perspective of how to actually create a one-shot, once you've worked out what you're going to be using it for, is it purely for entertainment, in which case it can be fast, it can be fun, it can have nothing serious to it. Is it purely for seriousness? Anyway, once you've worked that out, then you take that sentence and you apply it and say, okay, well, if they want this or they want that. So for this Tokyo game uh, book that I'm writing, for example, I sent through the first draft and the publisher wrote back and said, listen, they love it. Would I mind writing a one shot that will sit at the back of the book for people to use so that they can experience what it's like to role play in a cyberpunk Tokyo setting? My mandate was pretty clear. Showcase some of the elements that are in the book. The book includes different gangs, it includes different districts, the, the different areas of Tokyo. There's new structures that have been built specifically because it's cyberpunk type of stuff. So I went, okay, my one shot needs to include at least three of the different gangs, maybe four of the different gangs, because I think there are eight in total, eight or nine in total. It needs to include those so that we can show off the differences between the gangs, as well as the relationships between the gangs, because it could be quite a politically heavy game. We don't want that necessarily. It needs to show off some of the vehicles and some of the transportation and stuff that happens. It needs to show off this. It needs to show off that. So I basically generated lists of things that it needed to show off and then apply the sentence going, OK, well, if one of the gangs wants something badly and is having difficulty getting it because the other gang has it, how do the players get involved? What if they have what the first gang is actually looking for. The second gang who's being accused of having it is looking for it as well. They're now being hunted by two gangs. A third gang can get involved to provide protection for the PCs, which creates this interesting web around them as well as them themselves. And then we just go through different locations to explore what it's like to run around in, say, New Shinjuku or in old Akihabara or whatever and then we can explore it from there. So it's maybe a little bit technical approach to it, and maybe it doesn't create the most amazing one-shots, but it definitely gives you a sense and a flavor of what you're trying to do. So again, it's about what and how do you want to, 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 to showcase that. Uh, the system that it's using, the rule system, um, is that a question for me? I don't think it is. Uh, so there we go. I'm not sure if it's for me. Anyway, that um, Carbon Cyberpunk game uh, utilizes the open source D20 system. It's quite fun writing for that. Uh, it's a lovely system. It's very clean. It's very simple. Um, and all I can say is I was quite happy when I came up with my version of a Cyberpunk Katana. But I will come back to that when the book is released. Until next week, thank you all for being part of the stream. If you've only just joined, I'm afraid that's it. The show ends. It started two hours ago. Um, thank you for joining. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're on YouTube. If you're on Twitch and you've got a subscription going, well, join up the channel. Why not? Um, until then, thank you so much for being part of the show. I have appreciated your company. I have enjoyed your questions and your creative comments as well as your incredible support thus far. And until the next time, all I can say is happy gaming.